Hey everyone, welcome to Anthem Online. My name is Bert Alcorn. Today is gonna be a little bit different. First of all, thanks so much for tuning in, whether you're watching on Facebook, on our website, or somewhere else. Uh, I'm so delighted you are here. We've said this over and over and over again, but if you are stumbling across our video and you are engaging in some kind of format, we believe it's because God intends for you to be here and to be engaging with the things he wants to speak to you through the text today. So thank you so much for being with us. Today is different. Today is Celebrate Generosity. Now, if you've been hanging around the Anthem story for any length of time, you know all about Celebrate Generosity. But if you don't, I'll give you a little bit of a primer. Every single year on our anniversary as a church, from when we opened our doors day one, we chose to celebrate our anniversary a bit differently. Instead of throwing just a huge party, which we do love parties, um, we actually choose to focus on how God's been generous with us and then how we can be like Him and generous with others. And so we celebrate our anniversary with something called Celebrate Generosity. Celebrate Generosity, we do every single fall on our birthday, and it is a day where we celebrate the generosity of God towards us and where we get to be like Him and be generous as a people. What does that mean? That means on the day of Celebrate Generosity and the week after, so Sunday through Saturday, we give away 100% of all the money that comes in as a church. All the tithes, all the offerings, all the extra gifts on top, we give 100% of that away to our global, local, and church planting initiatives. Now, what I'm excited to do with you today is to actually take a little bit of time and teach from the scripture on a biblical heart of generosity and why this is such a big deal for us as a church. And on top of that, we get to hone in and watch some stories and some highlights from the local, global, and church planting organizations that we are partnering with this year. Every single Celebrate Generosity, we find a couple of organizations to give to globally that are doing gospel-centered compassion and justice work around the world. We do the same for the cities that we are planted in and we invest in some new church plants. So the plan for today is you're gonna hear me teach a little bit, a few moments, a few key passages in scripture that are gonna inform our hearts and our minds around Jesus's view of generosity. And then we'll get to together hear from some of our incredible ministries and partners that we get to saddle up with this year and give hopefully Lord willing a crazy amount of money to. Now, that's what you've stumbled onto today. I hope today is a blessing to you. And not only that, I hope from what you are hearing, from what we are reading together in the text, that you are invited in to the story of generosity that God is doing here at Anthem Church. So thank you so much for being with us. I'm excited for the morning ahead that we have together. But before we get too much farther, we also have something else really incredible that is kicking off this week. On Tuesday night, we are launching Alpha. Now, once again, if you've hung around Anthem for any length of time, you know we love Alpha and we've run Alphas in the past. And obviously because of the season that we are in, running Alpha is a little bit tricky and we are running Alpha online this year. Now, what is Alpha? Alpha is simply an environment, it's a space where anybody from any background can engage in questions and conversations around life, faith, and meaning in a fun and non-pressurized environment. Normally, those meals are had over dinner and it's a beautiful meal that we get to lay out, but in our COVID world that we find ourselves in, we'll be having those conversations online. And I would like to invite you to do a couple of things as we gear up to launch Alpha Online Tuesday night. One is I want to invite you to join us, especially if you are um, learning more about Jesus, especially if you have questions about Jesus, about faith, about meaning. I would like to invite you to join us from wherever you are for a series of conversations around life, faith, and meaning. Second thing is I would love for you to pray for Alpha. If you love Jesus, if you're in a relationship with Jesus already, pray for the work that will be done on Alpha and the conversations that will happen. Third, I want to encourage you to invite someone along with you to Alpha Online. And so whether you are coming, you're planning on coming or not, I want to encourage you to invite someone to come along with us on this journey, talking around life, faith, and meaning. So I hope to see you there Tuesday night. We're kicking off. You can find all of the information for Alpha at alphaventura.org. Go to alphaventura.org. You can learn a little bit more and you can register and save your spot for Alpha Online kicking off this Tuesday evening. Now, 
What we're gonna do now is we're gonna watch a little bit of a video to help us understand a bit more of the heart and the what is behind Alpha. Check this out. Every day we ask so many questions. What should I wear? What's the weather gonna be like? How am I gonna fit everything in? But then there are those bigger questions, like why am I here? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this? I had arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with. Is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist. gotten many of the things that I thought I wanted. You know, my girlfriend was on the cover of magazines, I had a Beamer, and I was so unhappy. It was a realization maybe that I would, I would never find happiness where I was looking for it. I think for so many years, you know, I always just strive to be strong in myself. All I needed was me and my buddies and, you know, would be like invincible. But the truth is, none of us are. And I found purpose, I found meaning, I found hope. God took something so broken and made it a beautiful art piece. Alpha is a place where you can be yourself. You can say what you think and challenge everything. No, no question is too complex or too simple. And what your point of view is, is as important as anyone else's. We are going on a journey together, an adventure to explore the questions of life, faith, and meaning. All right, welcome back. I'm so excited about Alpha Online this year. I hope you will join me. Wherever you're at, grab a Bible, open up a Bible app on your phone and head to Matthew chapter six. What we're gonna be doing today is I'm gonna look at three kind of moments in scripture, uh, three glimpses we get in the Bible um, from Jesus around generosity and uh, what our posture should be, how God is a generous God and we are growing to become like him. And this year, can we all admit, is fairly different. It's, uh, it's a strange year, uh, and it's a strange year for so many different reasons, but I actually believe there's some opportunity here. If you follow Jesus, in the craziness of 2020, disciples of Jesus have some real opportunity here to demonstrate where our hope is and where it isn't, which kingdom we belong to and which kingdom we do not belong to. And ultimately, in the language of Jesus here in Matthew chapter 6, where our treasure is, what it is that we prize in life, where it is that we are placing stock, placing value in. And in a season where so many have, have held back, so many have hoarded, I mean, just remember back into March when, at least here in Southern California, the COVID outbreak really hit with a vengeance here. Remember going to stores and not being able to find toilet paper anywhere? Now, there's nothing unique about COVID that would make us go to the bathroom more or less. But for some reason, toilet paper was out of stock everywhere. Why? It's because when our sense of security and comfort was challenged, our immediate posture is to go and hold back, is to hoard, is to protect me and mine, was to make sure I'm safe, make sure I'm secure, make sure I'm comfortable. Now, the way of Jesus will directly confront that way of living. It will. Now, 
Continuing on with the, the toilet paper example here. Now, I'm not saying this to say we were any particular kind of extra spiritual. We just did not like prepare and Costco up a whole lot of toilet paper. And uh, we just came back from a short trip and suddenly the shelves were cleared out. And it's like, well, we got like three rolls of toilet paper left. And, you know, we have three kids and one of them was potty training at the time. And so, and the kids just like to play with toilet paper and wad it up anyway. And so in a very real and small sense, we did have to live by faith a little bit. We had to live off the generosity of our friends who would throw us a roll every now and again, off the generosity of my in-laws who did make the Costco trip and gave us a pack. And we had to trust God for toilet paper. And in that moment, in that small, I get it, kind of goofy moment that I'm describing here, this was an opportunity for us to not actually hoard. And it became almost a little adventure. Where are we going to get toilet paper from next? I wonder if that's the story Jesus might be calling you and me into with our money this year. That is the natural default posture and position of the world around us when things get crazy is to hold back, to hoard. What if the response from those who follow Jesus was to actually give lavishly and to demonstrate our hope is actually not found in our bank account or a credit card statement. Our hope is found in Jesus. In a season where so many have held back and so many have gone myopic to just think about themselves and and their own families, the invitation to scripture, from scripture, will always be countercultural. And I think the invitation from scripture is to not hold back and hoard, but to actually give lavishly and give generously away that which we hold on to. The gospel will always challenge the assumptions and value structures of the world around us. It's literally an upside down kingdom. So we shouldn't be surprised that Jesus' view of money, of possessions, of comfort and security are going to challenge our views of those things. Especially us, at least in California and in America, we live in one of the richest places and the richest times of all time. And we are living in the most materialistic culture that has ever been. So in this culture of clinching, holding closed our fists, of holding back, of of hoarding, the invitation of Jesus is actually a discipline of release. Think of it like this. The world does this. The follower of Jesus does that. That's the invitation from scripture from all time in our place, but I also believe it's the prophetic invitation from Jesus to us in this moment of time. Christians should look different. Christians always look different. The problem in Christianity is when Christians have looked too much like the world, not when they've looked not enough like them. And one of the ways we can be distinct from the world around us is to have open hands. It's discipline of release. Giving in scripture is a means of releasing the stronghold that finances and money have on our life. The the stronghold that material things have on us and in our hearts. God knew that his people, just like all people, would become attached to all sorts of material things here and now. And in turn, worship them instead of him. And so giving is this means of releasing and it's this means of proclaiming where our worship is going to be directed. And what I want to do is I want to take you on a bit of um, a journey through some moments of Jesus. And the first one we're going to look at here in Matthew chapter 6 is a teaching from Jesus. Part of one of his famous, probably most profound moments here on earth, the Sermon on the Mount. A few chapters in the book of Matthew that are the compilation and collection of his manifesto of the kingdom of God. So go to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start together in verse 19. Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where the thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's crazy important. We're going to come back to that in just a second. He goes on. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. 
But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Then the light in you is darkness. How great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And in case we have missed the point, Jesus clarifies for us in verse 24, you cannot serve both God and money. How we handle money is of great importance to God because it reveals what we believe about God. You see, 16 of Jesus' 38 parables were concerned about how we handle money and possessions. In the Gospels, one out of every 10 verses, 288 in all, directly deal with the topic of money. The Bible offers roughly 500 verses on prayer, less than 500 verses on faith, but more than 2,000 verses on money and possessions. Writer and author of the book Money, Possessions, and Eternity, Randy Alcorn says this, quote, what we do with our money loudly affirms what kingdom we belong to, end quote. That's pretty profound. Jesus says you can't serve God and money. Randy Alcorn commenting on that story from Jesus says, what we do with our money loudly proclaims what kingdom we belong to. But what we do with our money doesn't simply indicate where our heart is. It indicates, according to Jesus, where our heart is going. Notice what Jesus was saying in those verses. Don't lay up treasures here on earth, the present. Don't lay them up here because moth and rust destroy. It can go away. People can break in and steal. It's fleeting. It's fickle. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now, he was speaking to A, real people, B, ghosts, C, zombies. (laughs) Who is Jesus talking to? He was not talking to ghosts. He was not talking to zombies. He's talking to people who live on earth, thus not people who live in heaven yet. So what he's doing is he's saying, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Tell your heart where to go by how you spend your money. If you're going to spend your money on things on here and earth, then your whole heart and your whole mind and your whole self is going to be wrapped up in all those things of this earth. You start spending money on the things of God and the things of heaven and the things of the kingdom of God, that's where your heart gonna, is going to be also. See, your heart follows where your wallet goes. Where's your wallet going right now? Money exposes where your heart is and where your heart is going. Where's your heart? Where's your wallet? Where do you want it to go? As you look at the future of your life, the trajectory of your life, the however much resources and finance the Lord will ask you to steward in this lifetime, where do you want it to go? Where do you want your heart to go? If I want my heart to be in a particular place and not in another, then I need to put my money in that place and not in another. If you guys notice this, if you invest in a, let's say, car, you're excited about that car. You're telling others about that car. You're evangelizing the car you just bought because that's where your heart is, because that's what you spent your money on. Same thing if you bought a house. Same thing if you give to a nonprofit organization. You start giving money to an excellent nonprofit, suddenly you become more invested in that nonprofit. You become more excited about what it is they're doing. See, what Jesus was talking about was not like a uniquely Christian principle. This is a human nature principle. Where your resources, your money, where your value is, that's where your heart is. That's what you're going to care about. Now, let's keep going. I want to keep going here in Matthew chapter 6 because I believe what Jesus does here is he answered our most frequently uh, asked question, our most frequent objection right away. We start to say like, okay, if we're going to give to kingdom things, what about me? Look what Jesus says right here. Verse 25, therefore, so English nerds, what do we ask when we encounter a therefore? What's the therefore? Therefore, right? It's therefore, it's connecting to the previous thought Jesus had about money, possessions, security, eternity. And Jesus says, therefore, in light of all of that, you cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Because how true it is when Jesus asks us to give something, we immediately go to, what about me? Therefore, 
Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, not about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even, in, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today alive and tomorrow thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, another word there is those who don't follow Jesus, seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. God knows. He knows what your need is. He knows how much your rent is. He knows what bills have got to be paid. But, Jesus, seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Now, I add in that section about anxiety because that's often our first thought when we're encountered with a moment of sacrifice. We're encountered with this moment of sacrifice, and our first thought is, what about me? What do I do? What about myself? What about my safety? What about my comfort? What about my security? And Jesus' response is quite simple. Ready? His response is this. Rearrange your priorities. Care about the things of the kingdom of God first. Then trust that God will generously provide for all of your needs. See, what we see from this text and this teaching from Jesus is a couple of things. Three things in particular. Generosity is a belief issue. Do I believe Jesus and his vision for the good life? Do I believe that when he says it's better to give and receive that he's telling the truth? Do I, do I believe that he sees the world better than I do? He sees me and my life better than I do. And so when he says it's better to give than receive, when he says you can't serve God and money, when he says lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, when he says seek first the kingdom of God, do we believe him? Do we believe that he's telling the truth? Do we believe that he's right? Now, before you jump to that answer, I dare you to go look at your bank account and then answer. Do we believe Jesus' vision for the good life? Second, generosity is a trust issue. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added to you. Do we trust that God will actually provide for us? Do we trust he'll clothe us and feed us like the grass of the field and the birds of the air? Do we trust that he'll provide for us? And third, generosity is a discipline issue. I hate to break this to you, but you will not just become generous by accident. You will not wake up one day and go, wow, I feel generous today. I think I'm ready to give away a ton of time and money and resources. No, you're going to wake up going, how can I protect what's mine? How can I get more? How can I save more for myself? And it is a discipline, a spiritual practice of release to go from this to this. To go from hoarding and clenched to open and available. It is a discipline, which means we have to try, which means we don't always get it right, which means we have to do it over and over again. And as we do it over and over again, we get better at it. And one of the things scripture tells us is as you do this over and over again and you prove yourself faithful, God will give you more and more so that you can give more and more. You see, God says, I'll add to your riches, add to your wealth, not so you can be comfortable and happy, but so you can give more. Generosity is a belief issue. Do you believe Jesus and his vision for the good life? It's a trust issue. Do you believe Jesus will provide lavishly for your needs? And it's a discipline issue. Will we build in a discipline of release, of letting go the things of this world and laying up for ourselves treasures 
in heaven. What is it that you need to wrestle with today? In this moment, this teaching from Jesus, what is it? I'll give you a hint. Where are you most resistant to the words of Jesus? Wherever you're most resistant to the words of Jesus, there it is that you need to invite the Holy Spirit in and ask him to change you. Now, one of the really fun things about generosity is, yes, it is a discipline of release, but we also can be excited about where this money goes. Paul in 2 Corinthians says, I want you to be a cheerful giver, not a reluctant one. We can be cheerful and joyful about how we're giving and where we're giving because with our generosity, God will take our meager resources and use it to fuel his mission here, wherever you live and around the world. And so I'm very excited to introduce to you or reintroduce to you two amazing organizations, uh, two of our global partners, Touch Nepal and Zoe International and the work we are doing. And as we think about generosity is not just about us and what we can release, but where those funds go to. So check out these videos from Touch Nepal and Zoe International. about the gospel. Jesus is what motivates us and we are desperate to have people know who he is. That is why we raise up local leaders, spread the gospel, train disciples, and inspire the church to world missions. The gospel has the power to transform. It will not just transform their lives now, but it'll see human trafficking ended all around the world. So we raise awareness, rescue those already trapped, and restore the lives of everyone involved. Since 2002, we have seen thousands come to faith in Christ and rescued children from some of the most horrific situations imaginable. We fight for the lost, we fight for the oppressed, we fight for children. That is what we do with people of faith. We are innovating all around the globe to bring the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Join the fight. Hello Anthem family, my name is Mark Avery and I along with Ryan Hinkle who is currently behind the camera right now are the directors for Touch Nepal. Touch Nepal has been a part of Anthem Church's global initiative to bring the gospel into this amazing third world country for the last five years. Now if you don't know anything about Nepal, I'll tell you a few things. Nepal is a landlocked country between India and China. It's only about a third of the size of California and it's home of the 29,000 foot high Mount Everest and the very majestic Himalayan mountain range. Nepal is also the birthplace of Buddha, uh, yet the country is only about 10% Buddhist. It's over 80% Hindu, known as a Hindu kingdom, with the Christian population being less than 3%. So it's kind of a big deal to run into another believer in Nepal. And because of Celebrate Generosity, we've been able to support such pastors as Babu and Sabitri Varghese and the Ministry of Blessed Children's Home, which cares for approximately 45 children. And as if caring for 45 kids isn't enough, they also run a Bible school, their own local church, and oversee a network of 17 other pastors in this very strategic area of Nepal. We've also been able to care for the people of Coconut Leprosy Colony and build so many great relationships there. God has worked so strongly amongst this gentle group of people. In fact, this community of some 200 leprosy affected people has the highest density of Christians of any group we know of in Nepal, about 40%, amazing. Touch Nepal also runs the Rays of Hope after school tutoring program, which makes sure that the most underprivileged children don't lose their opportunity for education. The tutors and supplies and books, they're entirely funded by our donors. The program is especially important now uh, during the COVID situation as the schools for young children have been closed for months. 
Over 95% of working pastors in Nepal have never attended a Bible school or had any formal training. That's why one of our most important programs is our remote area pastor training. Our Nepali program leaders Satya and Becky have strategically handpicked some of the most remote yet fruitful areas where our pastors need training. Our very own pastor Steve Larson is one of our teachers and curriculum writers. And Steve can tell you firsthand how these pastors, they just light up as they learn for the very first time how to exegete and correctly handle the Word of God. I hope you might agree with me that in times like these that human kindness and our generosity are shining just a bit more brightly than they usually do. And during the pandemic, Touch Nepal has been able to distribute over $15,000 of COVID and disaster related aid because of you guys, our donors. I'm feeling very blessed to represent Touch Nepal and be a part of the Anthem Church family along with you guys. And I hope as you get excited about Celebrate Generosity that you'll remember that you are directly touching lives in Nepal and giving the other 97% who don't know Jesus in Nepal that chance to know Jesus. Sabi Janalai Yeshu Kunauma Jamesi. And I said to all of you in Jesus' name, I say Christ is victorious. Man, I hope you are as stirred and encouraged as I am from those videos and the stories coming out of Nepal and Thailand. Uh, while generosity is a discipline, it is also a joy. And what a beautiful moment we get to celebrate the generosity of God in and through us. Okay, if you got your Bibles uh, still out in Matthew chapter 6, just flip a few pages over to the right. Go to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. We looked at a teaching from Jesus in Matthew 6, and now I'm going to look at a story of Jesus from Matthew chapter 14. And this story is going to demonstrate something really profound, that when we join God in his work, when we do seek his kingdom first, when we do lay up those treasures in heaven and entrust him with our whole selves, what I love about this story is we're going to find out that he will multiply our effectiveness. When we give him our little, he makes it much. Not for ourselves, once again, but to go out. Check this out. Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. Now, when Jesus had heard this, uh, the, the death of John the Baptist, that's the linking phrase here, when he had heard that his, um, his cousin, uh, John the Baptist, another one of these proclaimers of the gospel, uh, was, was killed, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But, as is common with Jesus, when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and I love this moment from Jesus, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. So Jesus was needing a moment. And then he sees this huge crowd and his compassion overwhelms him. And he was with them, he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. And apparently he was doing this all day because now Matthew says in verse 15, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place which was the idea, like Jesus went to that desolate place, verse 13. He was going for the desolate place. He was not planning on the crowds following him there. But he said, this is a desolate place. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus says, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. <laughs> now, we're going to find out here how many people were at this gathering, how big this crowd was. I can't imagine being one of the disciples in that moment where they're trying to maybe get these crowds out of here and say, oh, okay, what a great day of ministry, Jesus. Let's, let's put a nightcap on this puppy. We'll go off to our campsite. Let's all these people go back to their towns. And Jesus says, no, they don't need to go away. And we think this place was actually far from the towns and villages. It would have been too far to go to that night. He says, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. And it wasn't even theirs, by the way. The story in John chapter 6, retelling the same account, says it was a little boy's lunch, right? So they take this little boy's lunch box and they say, this is all we've got. This is the only food. And the whole crowd here are some fish and some bread. Jesus 
undeterred, says, bring them here. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So roughly 20 to 25,000 people fed off a few bread, a few loaves of bread, and a few fish. Now, I love this story for a number of reasons. Mostly, I love moments when Jesus just like, I don't know, is witty, is sarcastic. It's kind of just challenges the assumptions of the people around him. They say, ah, let's send these people away. And Jesus says, ah, they need to go away. Why don't you try feeding them? And they look around and after stealing lunch from this little boy, they said, ah, we don't got anything. And Jesus says, take it. That's all I need. Go ahead, bring it here to me. Now, there are two things I want you to notice about the story of Jesus. Two multiplication principles here. As we are considering and thinking about giving and giving huge for Celebrate Generosity here, look at these two moments. Look at these multiplication principles. First, it has to be blessed before it can multiply. Jesus could have said, all right, just distribute the bread. I'll do my Jesus thing and everyone will have enough. He said, no, no, bring it to me because we're going to bless it. We're going to give God credit for this moment. If that little boy had had a selfish heart and wanted to keep his food just for himself, saying mine, the miracle would have never happened. Right? The first step is to have this generous heart and ask God to bless it. What if the disciples had given out the food before it was blessed? Would it have been multiplied? I don't know. I can't answer that question. They might have thought, well, at least a few people can eat lunch and we'll make sure a few people get some lunch. But they brought it to Jesus, asked him to bless it. Now there's this moment. Now, obviously you're watching online. We're not in person here together, but there's this moment in every Celebrate Generosity where we actually bring the uh, literal and figurative offerings. You know, so many people give online, but we do have a moment where we pass some baskets, a practice we don't actually do in our gatherings, but we do it on Celebrate Generosity. We bring it to the front and we bless it. And we say, God, this is yours. Do with it what you will. Thank you for this meager contribution. Would you make much of it? First, it's got to be blessed. In all four accounts of the story in the New Testament, in all four of the Gospels, Jesus takes it and blesses it. Second, it has to be given away before it can be multiplied. What if the disciples had, had brought it to Jesus and he blessed it, but then they just ate it? They said, sweet, at least we have some, some lunch here. It would have multiplied. Can you imagine, though, in this moment, this little boy's amazement that his lunch fed 20 some odd thousand people. Can you imagine the boy's amazement at this miracle, let alone the disciples' amazement at this miracle? Jesus used my lunch to feed 20,000 people. Look at all the people it fed. Like I bet there was no question in that boy's mind or the disciples' mind who Jesus was and what he was capable of. I bet the faith of the disciples and that little boy grew exponentially that day in the ability of Jesus to do anything. Do we have the faith of a child in the ability of Jesus to do anything, including multiplying our meager contribution? Or do we look at the need in the world and say, my little bit won't actually really help. You know, what's astounding to me is one of the most common pushbacks to giving and generosity I hear from people is they often tell me, I don't, I don't really have enough to, like what I have to give won't make a difference. It's not that much. I have about this much margin in my budget and it's not really enough, so I'm just gonna wait until I can give more. Well, first thing, they never do. You never wait till you can give more because there's, you never have that opportunity because as life continues, as maybe your pay increases, so does your need, so does your comfort, so does your wants. But secondly, it betrays what we actually believe about Jesus. Yeah, I can, I can give $10 to this, but I actually don't think that's enough, so I'm just going to hold back. It's not worth it. Other people can give more than me. And what that actually does is it betrays what you believe about Jesus. It exposes that you don't think Jesus is powerful. 
You don't think he's capable of anything. And what I love about this story, this story is it throws that out on the table and says, look what Jesus can do with a very little amount. Some fish, some bread fed 20,000 people. What do we believe about Jesus? Through the unselfishness of this boy, God multiplies the generous effort. How good is that? Now, one of the interesting things about generosity is it can always feel far away. Like we're giving to things around the world. We just watched some videos from Touch Nepal and Zoe International. And those are beautiful and amazing and brilliant, but they feel far. And what I love about this story is the boy got to see the payoff from his generosity. He wasn't, he wasn't like Paul, you know, and some of Paul's supporters supporting the work out there, which is beautiful and needed. But this is a story where the boy sees the payoff from his unselfishness, where he gives his little, and with his own very eyes, he gets to see the miracle of Jesus. And so up next, we're gonna watch a couple of videos that highlight the need among us and how our meager generosity, God can multiply to have massive impact. And we get to see it in our own backyard. So especially if you are here in Southern California, we're gonna watch some stories from the city center, which is in Ventura, downtown Ventura, helping homeless people and particularly homeless families transition from homelessness to lives of stability. And we're going to uh, hear a bit from Garrison and Meredith Wash, who are planting a new church in South Pasadena. And what is beautiful about both of these stories is we get to see our generosity seeded into things that we can see with our own eyes. This is not halfway across the world. This is right here in our very backyard. So let's check out some of these stories. Over the years, I mean, I, I had been between outpatient and inpatient, probably six different <laughs> rehabs. There's only a, um, you know, a couple that I actually ended up completing. I was homeless for three and a half years. I had to reach out with them because I had lost all my savings. I had used drugs for about five years and I have two older children. I was living with my mom and she had, you know, kind of like told me you have to go, your kids can stay. So at that point I was like um, homeless for a couple years. Some people think that homelessness is never going to go away, that it seems like a never-ending battle. And, and yes, it is a fight, there's no doubt about that, but I have to tell you, there's hope. The mission of the city center is to help homeless children and their parents, and when they move into the city center, our whole goal is to be able to help them be self-sufficient. So when they walk out of here, they don't ever have to worry about being homeless again. Before I came to the city center, I was a high school dropout and a worker. As a single parent, I felt that was enough. But when the city center became an opportunity for me, I realized that I was capable of more. And since I've moved into the city center, I've been able to get my GED and finish three semesters of college. And I don't think that's the end of it. I think that I can leave here confident with a general degree in college. I'm so grateful for the city center and you know allowing me the chance to have a place for me and Caleb to live with a roof over our head, somewhere safe, where I can depend on the people um, and be able to, you know, clear up the wreckage of my past and to save up for a place of my own in the future, and you know allowing me to work on getting a career so that I'm able to support me and my family after I leave the city center. So what we do is we provide. Um, case management for them every single week. Because we know how difficult some of the situations have been, we provide therapy for them. So we provide a team of therapists to talk about maybe past traumas and things that they've dealt with in the past. They'll go to classes to help them with their finances. So to learn how to do a budget, to learn how to save. It's important that the whole person gets taken care of, just not bits and pieces. This time it's like I have a community of people. I feel like they're all my family. The staff here is awesome. I can go to them with any kind of issues and they help me figure it out in a healthy way and I can depend on people, you know, to help me with childcare, whatever I need, or just, you know, somebody to listen to me. So I really enjoy living here with the community of people and, you know. <laughs> I was here a little over three years and my whole life changed. Like I was able to go back to school, I was able to have a savings account, I was able to get my license, buy a car. I always say that living here was like winning the lottery because 
it gives you the opportunity to just like get your life together. I've been at a dental office so working there for almost th oh, three years. I live in a little house with my older son and my little one and then I have about six and a half years clean and sober. I'm so grateful and I've um, been graduated from here for about two and a half years and but this place I just I love it. <laughs> in order for us to continue to do what we do we definitely need the partnership of our community. Um, we are in need of funding. There's, uh, we, we ask that you would sponsor a room. That helps us keep a family in that room for a year. We also always have projects on campus. I'm so happy to say that every person, every family that has graduated from the City Center Transitional Living, not one of them has ever gone back into homelessness. I hope you guys are doing well. We are so honored to be a part of Celebrate Generosity this year. My name is Garrison and this is my wife, Meredith. We've been a part of Anthem Church for about three years now and it's been such a joy to do life with so many of you guys and call this place home. Yeah, about three months ago we were excited to announce that we're launching Steadfast Church in 2021 and we just wanted to take some time to explain the dream and the vision for why we're going and, and what we feel like God is doing in South Pasadena. Back in January, we really felt God asking us to start praying over the city of South Pasadena. And it's already been a place that we personally felt really connected to. We have friends and family in the community, and we both just individually felt this connection to the city. But as we began to pray, we just felt God calling us into something more. And as we began, to pray throughout the city. We felt like God was actually birthing something in us. He was writing a, a powerful story. Um, but we also realized that like God has been working and, and writing a story in South Pasadena for quite some time. And we're, we're just honored to be a part of that story. As we began to just search the scriptures and really ask God what kind of church he wanted us to plant, the thing that really stuck out most to us was this picture of family that we saw in the scriptures. We don't just want to be a community that's centered around an event or a Sunday gathering, but we really want to be a community that's living life together on purpose uh, to really transform our city through the gospel. Uh, we want to be a community that's built on the teachings and the practices of Jesus. And this doesn't mean that the Sunday gathering isn't so important and doesn't add value to what we're doing, um, but it's not the main thing. The reality of the kingdom of God is that God is inviting us into an every day, everywhere, with everyone, fullness of life encounter of Him. That we get to partner with Him as He bridges the gap between His kingdom, the, the heavens, the heavenly places, and the places that we find ourselves. This means that we're doing life together, that it's not just the event, but it's actually so much more than that. God is inviting us into so much more than simply just a Sunday gathering. And this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to, to be with each other and to become like Jesus, to be with him, to do what Jesus did in the context of community. This is our vision for Steadfast Church, to pursue the presence of God together, bringing life and hope to the city and the people around us. Our goal isn't to become something impressive or important. Honestly, our, our, our dream is to reflect the, the character and heart of God. That's why we named our church Steadfast Church. Steadfast is one of the most predominant words in scripture used to describe the character of God and his people. And we wanted to reflect that, that we would reflect his heart and his compassion towards the world. Our hope is that you wouldn't become a good, steadfast church member. Honestly, this may not be the best thing to say in a, a vision video, but uh, we, we honestly, our, our dream isn't that you would simply just come to steadfast church. I mean, okay, so we'd love for you to come, but I mean, our dream for you is that you would become a follower of Jesus, that you'd step into the life that he's inviting you into, and that you would live and experience the fullness of life that he has to offer. So this is our dream for South Pasadena. 
and we would love for you to be a part of it. If you're interested in connecting with us, you can do that directly through our website, steadfastchurch.org. Yeah, thank you so much for your prayers and we look forward to connecting with you. All right, now with all of this under our belts, we got, important, we got to remember one really, really important thing. God doesn't need your money. I don't know if you're used to hearing that from a pastor, from ministries, or, or from a day that's basically a whole fundraising day. God doesn't need your money. He wants your heart. But he will use your money to further his kingdom because it will do something to your heart. One of the prophets in the Old Testament, Hosea, there's this beautiful, brilliant little line that gets picked up again in the New Testament, but I'll read it straight from the source in Hosea 6, 6. And the Lord says, I desire steadfast love, not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. God doesn't need your money. He wants your heart. But, He'll use your money to accomplish his will in the world and his will in your heart. Look at how Jesus and Paul both talk about money and possessions and giving. Notice it's, it's not at all about giving to get more. It's not a, at all about a dollar amount or anything like that, but it's actually about your heart and how the kingdom of God in the world actually works. Look at this. Paul says things like this in 1 Timothy, for those who have money, be generous so you can experience true life. And he says to the Philippians, I've learned the secret of being content. And that secret is Jesus. And Jesus says it's more blessed to give than receive. You can't serve both God and money. He says life doesn't consist in the abundance of possessions. And he says when you give to the needy, don't make a big deal about it. And when the Father sees what you're doing, he'll reward you. He says don't put your resources in things that can be taken away in an instant. Put them in places that matter. I mean, talk about the ultimate wisdom and stewardship and, and business savvy. You want the healthiest ROI on your investments. Invest in the things of God. Now, according to Jesus, where we put our resources is where we put our heart. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It exposes not only where your heart is, but where your heart is going. Jesus is primarily concerned about your heart. And generosity is just one of the many avenues to achieve what he wants to achieve in your heart and in my heart. So on a day that's particularly focused around giving and generosity, where's your heart? What is your heart given to right now? And where is your heart going? So you look at the trajectory of your life. Where's your heart going? Now, there may be a few different generosity stories here, and um, I, I don't know you who are watching what your generosity story is like. Maybe you've never given anything to a church or a nonprofit organization. Maybe you've just been accustomed to having all of your money be yours. Maybe some of you kind of give a little bit, but you've never really experienced the joy of like lavish giving. And maybe some of you give and give regularly. Honestly, I'm not here to give you any practical or next steps other than Engage the Holy Spirit in this. He wants your heart, but he'll use your money to get to your heart. What do you think God wants to do in you today? Now, there are some practicals around Celebrate Generosity. So if you do want to give and, and contribute and participate in Celebrate Generosity this year, all the giving that comes in today, uh, online, Sunday through Saturday, this entire week all goes 100% out our doors into our global, local, and church planting initiatives. And if you're giving by check and you're mailing that in, just make sure it's postmarked sometime this week so we know to apply it to celebrate generosity. But genuinely, the invitation today is to examine your heart. And even in whatever I've said or whatever videos that we've watched together today, what is it that you had the most resistance to? Chances are that's where Jesus wants to do his work. Meet him in that space. I dare you, meet him in that space and be challenged to grow. But also, God, God will meet you there. He will provide for you. He will encourage you. He will do a work in your heart. 
That's my prayer for you today. I wanna pray for you. Thank you so much for watching today and I hope it's been an encouragement to you and it's been challenging to you and it's been an invitation to you to join what God is doing here at Anthem. I wanna pray for you and then I have just a couple of practicals I wanna share. Jesus, thank you so much for all those who are watching this from wherever they're watching. I trust they are here because you have them here. And Jesus, I pray that we'd not even be focused on money today, but we'd be focused on the work you want to do in and through us. Give us a vision for how our meager finances can impact the world for you. And also give us a vision for how when we release, when we engage in this discipline of release, you actually not only provide for us, but you grow us. Help us to be countercultural witnesses to this world of hoarding and holding back and clinching. Help us to be countercultural witnesses by how we are generous in our time, generous in our spirit, and generous with our finances. We end today just thanking you and confessing we trust you with our whole selves. And we trust you when you say the whole earth is yours and everything in it. And we are but stewards for a short amount of time. We ask that you would be made much of today. Amen. Amen. Thank you again for for joining us today. Uh, One simple next step and practical next step. If you are new, new newish, if you want to learn more about Anthem, the absolute best way to do that is to text Anthem to the number 97000. When you do that, you'll get an immediate text reply back with a few links that will help you learn more and reach out to us if you'd like to get connected. So I hope to hear from you. I hope you take a next step in getting connected here at Anthem. And I genuinely hope you engage with the Holy Spirit in the work he wants to do in and through you today. Thanks for watching Anthem Online. We'll see you again next week.